Gab, it's time for you to grow up and accept responsibility. What do you think of when you think of plastic surgery? I'm here to get my snatch tightened. <laughs> Fish-lipped women on the Real Housewives series. Maybe aging Hollywood actors who kind of look like burn victims. Michael Jackson's disappearing nose or Lindsay Lohan's rubberized lips. When internet slideshows of plastic surgery fails are only a mouse click away, it's easy to think about facelifts, eye jobs, and all the rest as the province of people who refuse to grow old the way nature intended. But that's not the only way, and it's certainly not the best way, to think about plastic surgery, as the new documentary Take My Nose, Please makes abundantly clear. There's actually one class of celebrities that will be very honest about cosmetic procedures they've undergone. You don't look exactly like the Joan Rivers I used to know. And that would be comedians. I take that as a compliment. Yeah, yeah. Directed by the nearly 90-year-old journalism legend Joan Crone, Take My Nose follows two actresses as they contemplate getting work done. Along the way, viewers learn the history of modern plastic surgery and are exposed to a powerful argument that plastic surgery is just one more way of improving ourselves, like diet, exercise, and education. Crone's wide-ranging, funny, suspenseful, and erudite movie drives home the libertarian point that nips and tucks are about self-actualization and self-reinvention, not immature fears of growing old or a sign of unrestrained narcissism. And then I had a facelift, then I had a breast reduction, but being Jewish, they grew back. I don't know how. <laughs> if there's one thing Joan Crone knows, it's self-reinvention. Born in 1928 and raised in New York City, Crone studied costume design at Yale's graduate school, she skipped undergrad, before getting married to a Philadelphia doctor. She joined the city's arts council in the 1960s and brought Andy Warhol and the Velvet Underground to perform at the YWHA. And she began her journalism career at 41 years of age. After the collapse of her marriage, she moved to New York, where she became the Wall Street Journal's first fashion writer wrote for New York Magazine and was a regular at the New York Times Magazine. She became editor-in-chief of the high-end lifestyle magazine Avenue. She was in her 60s when she started writing a beauty column for Allure, and in 2000 she wrote a book-length account of getting her own facelift. To visit Crone in her art-rich Upper East Side apartment is to be granted an audience with a woman who has blazed a unique trail through the last century of American life. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason, and today we are sitting down with Joan Crone. She's the producer and director of the fascinating new documentary about plastic surgery called Take My Nose, Please. Joan, thanks for talking to us. Thank you, Nick. What do you hope to accomplish? Is it to make plastic surgery either more acceptable or to have a wider conversation no. about it? Oh, I didn't do this for a cause. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make a movie. Mm -hmm. but you <laughs> I are... wanted to make a movie about something I knew about. What is it about plastic surgery that people find uh, both compelling and yet they resist it at the same time? It's, it's a fascinating subject because it's about science, it's about psychology, it's about um, horror in a way because it's the fear that a person could change them, their appearance it's about deception, and it was also about making yourself better looking. Mm -hmm. And it, it is capable of doing all that, but it's also capable of making you worse looking. Why do, we, why do so many people draw the line at surgery to enhance or to make yourself feel better about yourself? So you have all kinds of psychological reasons why people um, are against plastic surgery and they attach it to... to an idea that it's better to be natural. Right. And there is no such thing as yep. natural. Right. If we were natural, you know, our hair would be, our nails would never be cut and our hair would be down to the floor. And change is very frightening to a lot of people. It's exciting and it's also frightening and it can be dangerous but it's not as dangerous as you think it is. Introduce us to the, the two main characters that you follow as they're thinking about having plastic surgery and other things are going on in their life. There's Emily and Jackie. Who is Emily and why does she, what does she want and why does she want it? Emily Askin is a unknown, mostly, to most audiences. She's an up-and-coming, uh, improvisational uh, comedian. I've always said that I have some unfortunate angles. I have a Jewish nose. I mean, ooh, that's probably offensive to people, but I'm Jewish, so. She studied at uh, the school that Amy Poehler started, which is 
the Upright Citizens Brigade, which is a comedy school. I stumbled on her when I was looking for somebody to be a star of this film. And I Googled her, and I found out that she has a beauty salon in Pittsburgh, which she did at that time. And um, I called her up, and uh, when I told her the name of the film, Take My Nose, Please, she said, oh my God, I've always wanted my nose done. And, and she has she has a bump in her nose. It is a sort of like philosophical dilemma to alter your appearance just because you can. She has a bump, not a very not a very serious one, nothing that you might not even notice it. And uh, but it bothered her, and I took her to a leading, a prominent doctor in New York, and to, because I don't believe that I should be a diagnostician. And she had a chance to talk to the doctor and discuss her problem or issues. And um, then she decided that she might want surgery. The viewer doesn't know until you really till the end what happens. Right. Um, so one of the plastic surgeons who is uh, in a, or an expert in the film uh, talks about how different, different types of people are better or worse candidates for plastic surgery. And people who have low self-esteem and are doing it because other people are telling them that you're not pretty, you're not good looking, uh, you would look better this way. They're not good candidates for plastic surgery, whereas people who are kind of more inner directed seem to be. What, what is going on there? Sometimes people focus on, the, on a small defect or what they perceive as a defect and think if they change that, it will change their life when really there are other things going on in their lives. And making these small changes does not make them happier because that's not really the problem. And so he, des he describes it as body shame and body um, dissatisfaction, They're the two different. And if you have body dissatisfaction, you know that it's not everything and that it you could live your life and you'd be okay, but if you fix it, you might be a little happier. Um, and the people who have body shame believe that there's something that is there that, that makes them ashamed and they feel if they take that away, they will feel better about themselves, but often uh, it, the problem is much deeper psychologically. We're making it sound very boring, and okay. the movie isn't boring. Right. The movie is exciting because the movie is about comedians. They have families, they have love, they have problems, they have issues. And within a, kind of a, a bigger story about their lives, we're talking about how plastic surgery impacts them. But comedians have historically been the only people who have been honest about plastic surgery among celebrities. And uh, celebrities uh, practice what I call, they take the hypocritical oath. They lie about their plastic surgery and say they've never had it, and, and then they, in private they do have it. This is the kind of change that we're talking about. Regardless of how you look, people are going to judge you, so you might as well like looking in the mirror. <laughs> This is the happiest Christmas I've ever You have a clip, an interesting clip from uh, Jane Fonda mm -hmm. finally admitting that she right. had had, and she, in a way to go back to the discussion of natural beauty, she always said, no, I just worked out a lot or I, and I just ate right and all of that kind of stuff. Right. But she cops it. The other protagonist in the movie is Jackie, who is, is a comic actress, uh, very well known, um, and she talks about in 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 a in her routines about how ugly she is, how right. she's a dog. Was there any time that you liked the way you looked? No, that would be a no. I was a rude, ugly, stupid, boring, spoiled child. And if you think I'm self-loathing now, you're lucky you didn't see the one woman show I did when I was five. You want to do something to your face? Yeah. Jackie is the only woman. I mean, I've been covering this field for 25 years. She's the only woman who I've ever hear, heard say, I'm ugly and I know it. It's it just uh, very sad to hear a woman say that. And um, I was drawn to Jackie because she gave an interview in the Wall Street Journal saying 
that she regrets not having the nose job that her mother offered when she was 16. Now, if your mother offers you a nose job when you're 16, you have to live with this burden of knowing that somebody thinks that you really need a nose job and she's going to give it to you. And the movie can be seen as just a funny, hysterical take on plastic surgeon, surgery right. and comedians, because we have a lot of comedians and a lot of jokes and a lot of laughter, but there's also a lot of pain in our movie. Well, and this, you know, to t is talk about pain as well as happiness or triumph, there are two female comedians who are kind of the, the guardian angels, uh, Toadie Fields and Joan Rivers. Toadie Fields uh, was a kind of Zoftig, you know, Phyllis Diller, worse, worse than Phyllis Diller, uh, comedian who died after a plastic surgery, uh, uh, com a complication arising from that. Joan Rivers uh, talked, celebrated her plastic surgery. Um, what is is that kind of the alpha and the omega of of what's possible in plastic surgery? You know, a lot of people believe that Joan Rivers died of pl having plastic mm -hmm. surgery, and that's not true. And I liked to dispel that I mean, she was having. She had a raspy voice. I think I have a raspy mm -hmm. voice. <laughs> and she was t uh, having a procedure to see what was the matter with her esophagus in case there might have been uh, some polyps. And uh, that's how she died. It had nothing to do with plastic mm -hmm. surgery. Uh, Toadie Fields uh, was turned down by many doctors because she had diabetes and she was overweight. Hey! diabetes it can be very dangerous with surgery and um, she found with great effort she found people who would operate on her and um, she developed a uh, blood clot and she developed phlebi uh, phlebitis um, and lost a leg so I wouldn't say she didn't die of plastic surgery most people who have died while they were having a plastic surgery uh, treatment, do not die of the plastic right. surgery operation. And it's a terribly sad thing. She was only 48 years old. And it's a cautionary tale. Um, we, uh, I wanted to show every side of plastic surgery. I didn't want to sugarcoat it. Uh, this is not a movie that is a, for or against plastic surgery. It happens to be about plastic surgery, but it's also about human beings. You wrote a book in 1998 called Lift, Wanting and Fearing and Having a Facelift. Uh, you've had three facelifts, Botox, Relaxin, Restylin, and Juvederm. Um, what, how, did, how did that work? And obviously, you're also you're 89. Uh, oh, yes, so, I Yes, that's right. A first-time filmmaker at 89. Um, and it's not dramatic, right? It is, it's kind of making incremental improvements in your appearance, right? Plastic surgery can be extreme or it can be subtle. That's, it's, a, it's a couture operation. Usually uh, the goal is that you want to look just like a slightly a more rested version of yourself. Did it work for you or has it worked for you? I does it make it. you happier? Yes, does it make you when feel I better? When I look back at the pictures of myself, when I look back at the pictures of myself, I just feel that... I've been able to stay in the game longer. I'm still working. I've been working even before I made this movie. I was a journalist. And um, I doubt that I would have been employed if I had just let my face go older and older and older. Uh, yeah, obviously, you? I dyed yeah. my hair. Come on, I would have been a, you know, I could be a gray haired yeah. lady too, but I'm not. Does it bother you at all that, um, you know, one of the facts that comes out in the movie is that 90% of plastic surgery is, uh, is done for women or on women, uh, only 10% for men. Does it bother you that, uh, you know, Charlie Rose, who I'm sure has had work or is likely to have had work, or Dan Rather, or older journalists who are probably younger than you, you know, but look much older, like they, they don't have to have plastic surgery. Is, is that an issue at all? Or what? Why guess, do you use the word have to? Yeah, uh, the, you know, the, uh, prejudices, I guess. Yeah, but, right. It's got nothing yeah. to do with have to. It's a, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. it, it's a choice. Um, 
you know, when the science is there, why wouldn't we use it? I mean, uh, are you still riding a horse uh, when you could be driving a car? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's basically that's yeah. about what it's about. So what explains the gender, or talk a little bit about the gender issues, because plastic surgery is still mostly a woman's thing. Well, let's put it this way. In the beginning of time, thousands of years ago, in ancient Egypt, and the reason we know about ancient Egypt is that there was something called the Smith Papyrus, and it's the oldest medical document that we know about. There were probably earlier ones, but we just haven't found them. Okay, this one was found in the 19th century. Um, and in it, there's a recipe for how to make an old man into a youth. This is the first known treatment, an anti-aging treatment. And who is it for? It's for men. Women did not get any of the goodies in those days. The men got the goodies. And I think we're returning to that slowly. And so, yes, I think men are only 10% now, but it is inching up, and maybe they're 12%, and, and they're gonna be many, many more men doing this, and very soon, uh, I probably won't be here, but you'll be here, and it'll be 50-50. One of the people in the movie says that beauty, though, is the currency for women. And is that is that changing as well, or is it that and is it changing in the sense that women don't have to be as beautiful anymore, or is it that men have to up their game because they're also competing now, not just against other men, but women as well? It's very hard to be a woman and not notice who gets to have the starring role in every movie. And it's, it's very popular for people to say, well, look at Helen Mirren. <laughs> <laughs> but there's only one Helen Mirren. Right. And the, you know, and there are dozens of starlets who are now, you know, Emma Stones, mm -hmm. and who are getting all the good roles. And you can't help but notice that um, the prettier girls seem to to get the the ring and the. <laughs> in the uh, merry-go-round. Right. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about your career because, and, and in a, uh, I think it was an interview with AARP, you said it's, uh, um, it, AARP magazine, that it, it's good to be an icon or you should create yourself as an icon. You're an icon of, of journalism. Uh, you started, you're 89, you started working as a journalist when you were about 40, 41. Right. Over the course of your journalism career, what are the big, uh, what are the big lessons that you would give to today's media? Because, you know, print is dying, print is being reborn, broadcast. Why would I give a message to anybody? I said a lesson, not a message. <laughs> oh, but okay. what, what, are, what, are the, what are the lessons that you've learned that you think are, that people might benefit from knowing? Everything is transferable. Everything that you do can be, you know, you have to. Uh, I, I, I once got a free subscription to a. a, a a magazine that was put out by Harvard about, uh, Har I think, the Harvard Business School. And, I, and there was a very interesting article that said, if you're working for somebody and they need something, you have to fulfill the needs of the people you work for or you're not going to keep your job for long. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, uh, when I was at Allure and I saw that the tide was turning and that we started the, an, an internet blog, uh, I started writing immediately for that. And I loved writing for it because it's so immediate. I mean, you write it today and it's up tomorrow. And if you're writing for a magazine, you write today and it's up two months from now. And, um, and that was always, that uh, you know, I'm sure you understand that, that, that there's such, such a long wait and things can happen to your story and can get old. It's like milk, you know, and can start <laughs> turning sour. Right. So I loved writing for the um, for our internet, and and I found that I did better work on it. I thought I did some better work, and that was because fewer editors were putting their fingerprints on my work. You know, I don't know if I have a lesson for other people's lives. It's just that, what would I do if I? I mean, I just happen to be alive. You know, I'm not in charge of that. There's a lot of longevity in my family. What would I do if I didn't work? I would go shopping. Well, I need money to go shopping, so I work. 
then I can make a little money and then I can go shopping. Take My Nose Please is now currently doing the festival circuit. Where is the best place or how can people follow or get information about where it might be appearing next? Well, we're about to, um, we have been besieged by um, what distributors, that's the people who are going to help us get the uh, film out there on the airwaves or in the ether or whatever it's called. Um, on um, video on demand or all well, these Netflix new pla or Hulu platforms or whatever, yeah. that I don't even know how to describe. But I, they're generally t seen on a screen. Right. <laughs> right. What is your next project? I'm not going to tell you. Okay. My all next right. project is about the, uh, uh, something very important in the plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery world that I know a lot about, but I don't think a lot of other people know a lot about. And I think a lot of people will be interested in it. And we're going to do it in a very unusual way. And uh, I'm making plans. All right. Well, we'll leave it there then. We have been talking to Joan Crone. She's the producer and director of the uh, fascinating documentary, Take My Nose, Please. Joan, thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie. Thanks for watching.